the United States of America. Rich. Diverse. Well fed. Proud. Free. The United States of America. Poor. Hungry. Scared. Oppressed. There are those who say the United States is an empire, a dictatorship possessing fascistic elements. There are others who insist it's a democracy or a representative republic, the realized dream of the founding fathers. Can both assessments be correct? How can the nation known as the United States of America be both? How can there be two totally different views of the same thing? Is America an empire or a democracy or somewhere in between? I traveled from one end of the country to the other exploring these questions. By train, plane, bus, and microbus. I began my quest by speaking with two world-renowned historians, Drs. Michael Parenti and Howard Zinn. What's happening in the United States is a struggle between democracy and empire. Uh, democracy is a wonderful invention by the people of history to protect themselves against the abuses of wealth. It's not a question of are we or are we not a democracy, A or not A. It's not that precise. It is that we have democratic tendencies and democratic struggles and certain democratic inputs, very limited, and we also have plutocratic domination, where the plutocracy dominates the media, they dominate the uh, universe of discourse, they dominate the lobbying. When Mussolini described fascism as a union of the state and corporate power, I think he was right. Now, it's true that you can have a union of the state and corporate power and not have something as extreme as fascism. In fact, that's what we've had in the United States. We've had a, a union of the government and corporate power ever since the beginning of this country. There's an element of fascism in that. Fascism is not a, well, yes or no proposition. It's very complicated. You can have a society which is partly democratic and partly fascist. I mean, 
you, you have a society in the United States where all people vote and you have a choice, sort of a choice, <laughs> not much of a choice between two parties. You have a certain degree of civil liberties and you, have, you can put out underground newspapers or dissident newspapers, community newspapers, community radio stations. Yes, you, now that's not fascist, let me say. No. But, of course, you know, there are limits to, to those liberties. Are there fascistic elements in U.S. society? What exactly are the limits to our liberties? After all, the United States, despite its shortcomings, is the best country in the world. And I should know. I was born in the all-American suburb of Parma, Ohio. Just 20 minutes outside Cleveland, home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And what's more American than rock and roll? Divorce. About 50% of U.S. marriages end in divorce. And at the age of five, my parents got that all-American divorce. And we moved to the great state of Texas. I grew up in Huntsville, home of Sam Houston and 35,000 other people. We have one university, one high school, the largest statue of an American hero in the entire world, and nine, you heard me, nine prisons. In 1980, the film Urban Cowboy was shot at the old prison rodeo. And more recently, The Life of David Gale was set at my alma mater, Sam Houston State University. Even more interesting than movie stars, however, is my old high school. It was the first high school in the United States to get surveillance cameras, ironically enough, in 1984. Yes, this was an all-American patriotic town. In the United States, we enjoy freedom of speech, freedom of religious and self-expression, freedom to peaceably assemble. So where are the limits? What happened today was, by, e by the mere mention of September 11, a bystander that was listening to a conversation I was having with someone else heard the term Twin Towers. I mentioned no more about that subject, but somehow they thought I was some evil person. When we came into a stop in Denver, Colorado, immediately a whole squad of policemen from the Denver police came up and he, he immediately asked me for my identification and uh, started to uh, grill me about my talking to people about making bombs. I was floored. This is Winston. His crime? A philosophical discussion on an eastbound train. I caught the last bit of his police interrogation on tape. All right. For the rest of your trip, just keep my mouth shut. Keep, yeah, keep your views. That way you can stay on the train. If there is another complaint, don't put you off the train. You got to follow some rules. We live in a different time now. Anything that you think might be off key or a little touchy, you probably won't want to talk about for the rest of the trip. We're I'm not kicking you off. You I want just, to make the rest I'm of the ride I'm talking about out. love and peace and don't do this kind of bad stuff. Okay, well, you're very animated when you talk. That attracts attention to you. Mm. Okay? And if you do that, if somebody gets disturbed again by your actions, Amtrak is not going to... They're just going to take you off the train. You be, be a damn veteran for this country and this just doesn't matter anymore. If you're going to get upset about it, you might as well just get off the train. No, no, I'm, I'm okay. I'm fine. Right? That, that's, I just can't believe I've already instructed the conductor. Yeah. Any one altercation or anything, and if you're angry and I don't need you. No, I don't get angry. Okay, but what I'm saying is, when you leave, as you leave Denver, I don't need you expressing any type of uh, resentment or anger. I'm not going to have right. any. No, any, I'm I'm not, no, no, but, you know, no discussion. philosophical discussions. No animation that'll attract attention to you. We understand each other. We're 
Okay. I, I no. learned very quick. That's all I understood you the first time you said it and okay. stuff like well, that. we like to nail it in. I'm so just sorry that, that and just this so whole... They're, they're here and they understand as well as you I'm do. just sorry that this whole thing page. had to happen. This is absolutely... But like, like you understand. said, we're in different times now. We've got to be very careful about what we talk about. It's a different America, isn't it? It is. It's a very sad thing. It's uh, very unfortunate, sad. but that's the way of life now. He told me of how they searched through all his things without a warrant. Since he's been living abroad for the past nine years, he didn't know that with the passing of the U.S. Patriot Act, they no longer needed one. I asked him what it was like living in Europe. I say what I want, when I want, I'm very outspoken. I, I feel I have more freedom in Europe than I have here, frankly. I certainly feel safer there. My own mother... Hi. Hello. Do you think you'll ever come back to the United States again to live? After what happened today, I really don't know. I really don't know. I, I, I really could not believe how you can talk about love, peace, harmony, and self-healing and have that misconstrued as a terrorist subject and have the police come and spend maybe three quarters of an hour conducting an investigation. I was scared. I could not believe what was happening. And I don't know what's going to happen now. Are they going to start tapping my phones? Are they going to tap into my computer? Are they going to blacklist me? Am I going to be on some, some list somewhere? Does, does, does the president of the United States have a great big long list now? He can, he can just pick and choose who's his enemy or not? This sounds exactly like what happened during Stalin days. This is my country. I, it isn't anymore. I, I'm so hurt by what's happening here. What do I do? What do I do? You know, I joined the Navy as a young man wanting to do something uh, important for my country. And uh, I served 20 years. I've gotten a number of medals, accommodations. I've even got letters of appreciation for my service in it by the senior George Bush when he was president, when I retired. Um, and then I express my feelings about something political and I'm interrogated as if I'm a cr criminal and nothing mattered about my 20 year career. This is Mike. His crime? Sending an email. He tells us about his visit from the Secret Service. I sent out some emails to some friends of mine, and one month later, almost to the day, I uh, noticed some cars coming up in my driveway, and they were here to see me uh, regarding an email that they said they intercepted, and they asked me just point blank, which this really made me feel like a, a criminal when they asked me if I was planning on going to uh, Washington to shoot the president. They asked if I had any mental problems. Uh, did I take any drugs? They wanted to know all the medications I was on. Uh, prescription or otherwise. So I obliged them and, get, and they copied all the information down off my medical models and they wanted information who was my doctor, uh, what doctors have I seen since I retired from the Navy and that sort of thing. I, I'm on a number of antiretrovirals and one uh, antidepressant, uh, which I've been on that for years and it's really helped me a lot. But I don't see any problem with any of these medications concerning any of my actions. I didn't do anything wrong that I could see, and I was never offered an attorney. When they asked me a question, if I didn't have it right in front of me, I came in here and got it uh, like uh, they wanted to know any friends I keep close contact with uh, or, or relatives, you know, uh, like my sisters and, and everybody. They wanted to know their phone numbers and their addresses, and I'd have to come in here and get my address book and come back. So I think I was pretty cooperative in everything they asked me. I've often wondered here recently, what's the Secret Service, FBI, National Security Agency going to do with the information they collected off me that they didn't have before they drove up my driveway? That concerns me. Under Bush's new Homeland Security plan, that they're going to maintain a, a uh, computer base or database of everybody in the United States. They're going to know everything from IRS reports all the way down the line. Secret Service should have had all, all this information about me, and they were asking questions like they didn't have a clue who I was. They kind of threatened me with, be careful what you say on the Internet. That's unlawful. 
To me, it's unlawful. Freedom of speech covers freedom of speech in every aspect of the way, electronic or otherwise. Uh, when I was uh, 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 interrogated by the Secret Service, they drove up my driveway and said they intercepted an email. They might as well have just gone down to my mailbox and opened up every personal uh, letter I had down there, which used to be a felony, by the way. Uh, might as well have done that. I feel like my mind had been raped. I feel like I've been bushwhacked. An analogy would be like tearing up the Constitution right in front of your face. So when they come into my home and they invade my privacy and, and tell me uh, to watch what I say on the Internet and they advise me in so many words not to go to Washington, D.C., it just, it just validated exactly everything that I said in that original email. When any government starts collecting information off private citizens, I automatically think back to Soviet Russia because they had files on everybody in that country. And that's what I equate uh, George Bush to right now. The government agents have a right to go into anybody's home throughout this entire country and bug devices. They can even make up reasons, as far as I'm concerned, they can make up reasons why they need to plant that device. It used to, they had to get a federal judge. They don't need that now under the Bush uh, Patriot Act and the Homeland Security Bill that was signed. They can come into anybody's home without getting a federal judge. And... Uh, it's not going to change what I say. It's not going to change my political views. As a matter of fact, it's justifying them. But I'd like for America to know that we have a constitution and we shouldn't have to fight for our freedom of speech. It should be automatically given. And I've been watching our freedoms disappear for the past uh, 10, 15 years. If uh, this type of an event happens, can happen to me, it can happen to you. It can happen to anybody, anytime, Day or night. Uh, I was told that Bush was going to be speaking at The Ohio State University for a commencement speech for the graduating class in June of 2002. Shortly before the commencement speech that there was a protest rally called Turn Your Back on Bush. In the night before, graduating students were told that they would be expelled and arrested. You can't tell adults that they're not going to graduate if they don't stand up and applaud for the president. This is Jeff. His crime? Turning around while Bush was speaking. Here is his story. President of the university, Mr. Kerwin, says, The Ohio State University has a long tradition of inviting great men and women to speak at our commencement ceremonies. And he paused. I said, but since we couldn't get one, here's Georgie. Didn't take long after that. He takes the microphone, we turn. About face. Like that, like that, we're being let out. It was seconds. Had we done something to threaten the president in any way, shape, or form, yes, get me out of there. But all I did was turn around, and all my wife did was turn around. And my daughter, she was in her arms. We were no threat, but we were being let out right away. I've got friends who were there who were told specifically, you'll be expelled, you'll be arrested. And when they say expelled, though, they mean they expelled, meant expelled from, from the school. school. Yeah. No diploma. No. The hell with your four, eight, twelve years. The hell with your hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loans that you've paid off. You don't get your diploma because you didn't face the president and cheer him. I do know of a country that's done that before. And we defeated them in World War II. We are not supposed to do that sort of thing. We're the good guys. At least we were. I did something that is well within the boundaries of the law. And I was more of a patriot on that day than anyone else in that stadium. It kind of changed my ideas of the whole landscape of what's going on in this country. Well, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I started doing some research on other such cases of civil liberty violations. And here are just a few examples of what I found.
Throughout my research, I kept coming across comparisons to fascism and dictatorships. This sounds exactly like what happened during Stalin days. When any government starts collecting information off private citizens, I automatically think back to Soviet Russia. I do know of a country that's done that before, and we defeated them in World War II. Can the American empire be headed in the same direction as past empires? Let's take a brief look at the similarities between notorious empires in history. In each case, the leaders weren't democratically elected by a majority vote. Oftentimes, they were placed in power by the wealthy elite, or plutocracy. In each case, they waged preemptive wars, or just wars of expansion, always under the pretense of protecting their homeland. In each case, the citizenry were kept in fear of an external, elusive enemy. The governments would use this fear to undermine their civil liberties. In each case, it resulted in the shooting, gassing, or poisoning of their own people, and ultimately led to their own tragic downfall. Also in my research, I kept finding this, suggestions and flat-out accusations that the Bush administration knew or was complicit in the 9-11 attacks. The Bush administration reacted to it uh, as if it were waiting for something to happen. The attacks have, were, were used as, first of all, as a shock mechanism to render the American public immediately pliant, immediately supportive of any military action, and they have been used as a mechanism to instill fear, great depths and levels of fear into the American public. Uh, a newspaper asked me what was my prediction for the coming year, and I predicted that Osama bin Laden would be accused of blowing up a big building in New York, and the government would use it as an excuse for uh, curtailing all civil liberties. On 9-11, they got their pretext uh, for uh, expanding into uh, a corporate state that would encompass the whole world. I mourn the victims of 9-11 just like anybody else does. But I questioned why it came to that. I questioned why we gave millions and millions and millions of dollars to the Taliban months before this happened. They were responding to the history of the U.S. national security state's terrorism throughout the world and repression throughout the world by attacking. They were correct in the country they picked. They were incorrect in the kind of targets and demonizing all of America as an entity. You know, those people have just learned to hate us. I mean, we do nothing to help them. We abuse them, we take their oil, and we treat them like crap, and, you know, you got what you deserve. Now, I'm not saying that... It's a good thing, but it woke this country up. And now, like everything else our government does, the war on drugs, the war on terror, you always lose your civil liberties. That's the first place they go, because the only way they can stop it or they think they can control it is to take your rights away. And our rights are not the problem. Our foreign policy is our problem. I knew I had to go where it all began. New York City. I've been driving around New York for three hours. I can't even get to Manhattan. The road signs change. I, the roads change and they'll tell you where you're going. I, I don't even know where I am. Yes, I have a map. I don't know where I am on the map. Finally, I arrived in Manhattan. And boy, was it something. I, of course, visited Ground Zero. There I met a man who was alive due to a twist of fate. On September 11, 2001, I took my son to school. At about 8.40, 8.45, somewhere around, my boss called me and told me a plane hit the tower. I thought it was a bad, sick joke. I yelled at him. I said, it's a beautiful day. What are you talking about? 
This is Harry Rowland. Until 9-11, he was a tour guide for the World Trade Center. From the moment I looked out and saw that North Tower smoking, I knew he was no longer joking, but it was a serious situation. And I watched amazed and just froze in fear as I saw the second plane approach. Coming from the south, I watched this plane veer and accelerate into the World Trade Center. Here we are, years later, and the American people still don't really know what happened on that terrible day. A day of unprecedented events. Four planes were simultaneously hijacked, and subsequently, all air traffic came to a complete halt. Unprecedented. Within one minute, air traffic control knows Flight 11 had been hijacked. However, NORAD isn't informed for another 27 minutes. Unprecedented. It then took NORAD between 15 and 48 minutes to scramble aircraft, despite their own procedure to do so immediately when radio contact with the plane is lost. Unprecedented. Bush knew about the first plane upon arrival at Booker Elementary. At that same time, a public announcement is broadcast inside the South Tower saying that the building is secure and people can return to their offices. He knew at that point, and Bush sat there. He didn't show any emotion for 25 minutes. He sat there. The, the talk was, we don't want to alarm the kids. Hell, the kids were going to be alarmed within 20 minutes anyway when they found out the truth. The whole country was alarmed. Don't give me that. I don't want to scare the kids. Somebody didn't do the right thing, whether it was Bush for not getting up and moving, or whether it was his chief of staff for not saying, we've got to go, Mr. President, we've got to get something done about this. For 25 minutes, people died during those 25 minutes. You're the leader of this country. Act like it. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. And now if you join me in a moment of silence. May God bless the victims, their families, and America. Thank you very much. The Pentagon, the White House, and the Capitol were immediately evacuated. Frank Wheeler, United 93, is with you at 350. Enter men light stop. United 93, checking in 350. United 93, 350. United 93, that traffic field is 1 o'clock, 12 miles eastbound, 370. Negative contact, we're looking at United 93. Somebody call Cleveland. So United 93, verify 350. United 93, verify your portable uh, 350. United 93, verify your level at 350. United 93, Cleveland. United 93, Cleveland. United 93, if you hear Cleveland Center, I don't, please. United 1523, did you hear your company, uh, did you hear uh, some interference on the frequency room uh, a couple minutes ago, screaming? Yes, I did, 797, and uh, I, we couldn't tell what it was either. Okay. United 93, Cleveland, if you hear the center, I don't. American uh, 1060, you know, on the uh, other uh, transmission. American 
I'm here just answering your call. Uh, we did hear that uh, yelling, too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're just trying to figure out what's going on. What is that over here? They got the pizza dog. Keep it ready to be. We have a ball board. So it's there. Uh, calling Cleveland Center to unreadable. Say again slowly. Sir, did you hear the transition? Was that airplane that said he had a bomb on board? Uh, say so again, uh, was that United 93? Yeah, that transition, he said it was unreasonable. It sounded like someone said they have a bomb on board. That's what we thought. We just, uh, we, we, we didn't get it clear. Is that United 93 calling? Sector 956, that aircraft we believe was transmitting at 12 o'clock, 5 miles. Turn left, heading 225. I'll get you away from him. Okay, he's climbing, so I want to keep everybody away from him. Okay, I think we got him in sight. Well, the 1989 air traffic view is at 11 o'clock and 15 miles southbound. 41 climbing, looks like he's turning east by heading 360. Hi, uh, is the captain? I would like to go to the main team. We're on board, and we're going to the next airport, and we're on board, 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 and we're that aircraft you can't get a hold of the seat turn to the east now? He's just turned to the east also. United 93, you're here at Cleveland Center. Okay, American 1060 and Executive 956, we just lost the target on that aircraft. Okay, 956, we had a visual on him, just stand by. Do you have a visual on him now? Uh, we did, but we lost him at the turn. So you can make a turn back to 220 heading, let me know if you can see him. Yeah, he's still there, we got him for 956. He's still there, uh, northwest of you, about 25 miles. A permanent for 956. You guys get 956 fighting 180. Okay, we're making a turn for 956. He appears to be heading right towards us. American 1060, do you see anybody northwest of you? Can you shoot back that far there? Uh, we're looking down. Uh, the United 93, Cleveland, do you still hear the center? The United 93, do you still hear Cleveland? The United 93, United 903, do you hear Cleveland? United 93, United 93, Cleveland. United 93, United 93, do you hear Cleveland Center? Do you see any uh, activity uh, on your right side, smoke or anything like that? Uh, no, we don't see anything on your right side. Negative, we're searching. Yeah, we do have a right. smoke puff now at about, uh, oh, probably 2 o'clock. It appears to be just a uh, dark cloud, like a puff of black smoke. Battalion 4 lobby command post, Tower 1. Battalion 4-8, lobby command post, Tower 1. Operations, Tower 1, go lobby command post. Florio, we're on 78, but we're in the beef stand. We're trapped in here. we got to uh, put some fire up to get to you. Washington, D.C. that day. I want to know why he flew to Louisiana on Air Force One and then flew to an Air Force base in Nebraska. They tell us that it was because there was a general threat against Air Force One. Bullshit. There were no planes in the sky. There were no terrorist threats to Air Force One. Later, Ari Fleischer even said that we were mistaken about the threat to Air Force One. It's Air Force One. Give it a couple of fighter jets. Give it 30 fighter jets. But don't fly to Louisiana and then halfway across the country to Nebraska. 
and tell us that you couldn't get back to Washington right away. You were in the plane. If there was a general threat to Air Force One, then don't get in it at all. what state I was in when I heard about the terrorist attack. I was in Florida. And uh, my chief of staff, Andy Carr, well, actually I was in a classroom talking about a reading program that works. And uh, it, uh, I had, was sitting outside uh, the, the, the classroom waiting to go in, and I saw an airplane hit the tower of a, of a t you know, the TV was obviously on, and I I used to fly myself, and I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And uh, I said, it must have been a horrible accident. But I was whisked off there. I didn't have much time to think about it. I was sitting in the classroom, and Andy Card, my chief of staff, was sitting over here, walked in and said, a second plane has hit the tower. America's under attack. Why weren't the aircraft Why immediately crashed? Who tried to profit, profit off this terrible event when he could off? Why was Giuliani illegally storing 20,000 gallons of gas? Why from Russia, Germany, and Israel? Why did a CIA agent meet Why with someone by just for a new American, American war 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 in a U.S. hospital in Pearl Harbor? What are they trying to hide? And if I'm wrong, somebody show me some evidence to the contrary. Because until. You can give me more than just media reports about what a terrible day that was and how the families all got phone calls from their loved ones who knew they were going to die that day. That's not enough for me. I had a friend who was on Flight 11. I am certainly uh, one of the many, I think millions of people who believe that 911 was not what the official story would claim it was. The big Brzezinski published a book called The Grand Chessboard, which said that the United States public would need an event like Pearl Harbor to launch it into war, to overcome its uh, resistance to imperial kind of uh, moves. The uh, Project for a New American Century said the same thing. It referred to Pearl Harbor in its paper of 2000. On the day of September 11th, 2001, uh, network commentators constantly referred to Pearl Harbor. 9-11 has been the trigger for uh, domestic repression and global fascism. your son to school that took my morning? son to school. Basically, uh, my mother said you don't even question things like that. Some things are done for a reason. This was murder. This had nothing to do with anybody's Allah, anybody's Muslim thing. This is, this is murder. This is horror in its worst form. I can tell you how some people came out of the train stations and walked into this situation not even knowing what's going on on their way to work and literally froze in fear to, to see people jump out of windows. The events of that day just changed my whole life. Some say it was the turning point in history that the world changed on that day. So many opinions, so many questions, so few answers. Someday, people will look back on 9-11. And sure, they will see it as you know, the first terrible act of terrorism committed in the United States, you know, by some foreign group. But they may also see 9-11 as the beginning 
of the disintegration of the American Empire. Because from 9-11 came the war on terrorism, so-called, the bombing of Afghanistan, and then now the war on Iraq, and the bloating of the American military machine, and the, and the war budget, and, uh, and the deprivation of civil liberties. And, uh, yeah, and I believe that uh, it will be a victory in the short run and a defeat for the American government in the long run, and that defeat should be welcomed. We need a regime change in the United States. We need democracy. We need a government that's peaceable. We need a government that will take the enormous resources that the United States has, and instead of using it for war, use it for, well, human needs. For Millions of people are dying in Africa. I mean, this is the remarkable thing about this war in Iraq. Here's the President of the United States drawing a line around this tiny country and saying all evil rests there, as if there are no problems elsewhere as if there aren't millions of people going hungry, sick, a billion people in the world without clean water. You know, what a... The United States should be working on that. They shouldn't be killing, they should be helping and healing. So, yes, we need a, a regime change in the United States. We need a, a, something that will make American people proud. You can't be proud of a military victory over Iraq. You, know, you can't be proud of of spending the resources of the, of the government for more, more, more military weapons. Uh, so I, th I yes, I think the American empire is on its way down, uh, and I and that will be a good thing one day. Every nation, in every region, now has a decision to make. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. stop to think, to uh, ponder different alternatives, to ask uh, what is the proper response, what is the intelligent response uh, to this terrorist act, it immediately plunged us into war. That is, immediately President Bush declared a war on terrorism, which in itself is absurd, because you can't make war on terrorism. Terrorism is not that sort of thing. It's not a country. It's not a place. It's not something finite, identifiable. It's an ideology. There is no war on terrorism. That's the first thing to understand. It's not a war on terrorism. It's a war to deepen and extend American power around the world in which terrorism is the justification. It has nothing to do with terrorism. And so what happens is the Bush administration singles out a country, Afghanistan, where probably some terrorist cells some of the many, many, many terrorist cells exist and bombs Afghanistan for a year, killing several thousand people, probably killing as many people as were killed in the Twin Towers on September 11th. What does that do to combat terrorism? Nothing. Uh, does it diminish terrorism? No sign. It's in fact, the warnings about Terrorist activity keep coming to us day after day, week after week, uh, dire warnings. So obviously, all that that did was to establish Bush's reputation as a warrior, uh, as a tough guy. Uh, I mean, how imagine how tough the United States must be to be the most powerful military country in the world and to be able to bomb Afghanistan, one of the poorest, most miserable countries in the world. You have a new imperial power, the United States, running amok in the world. Of course, terrorism's a problem. If the United States government wanted to do something about terrorism, it would do something to produce some sort of justice in the world. It's a project in which the United States has considerable power, given that it's the wealthiest nation that's ever lived on the planet. It's the nation with the most extensive military capacity in the history of the planet. 
it's in a position of unrivaled power. And if the United States wanted to use that power to create a some rough justice in the world, which it could be the leader in doing quite easily, well, then we'd all be safer. There'd be less terrorism everywhere. That's not the goal. The goal is to enrich some small segment of the population, which George Bush represents, and to be fair, which Bill Clinton represented and every other president before them. That's how you get to be president. You don't get to be president by caring about ordinary people. Fate has handed the Bush administration, and undoubtedly subsequent administrations will use this too, a new kind of reflexive justification. And we're going to call it the war on terrorism. Our enemy is a radical network of terrorists and every government that supports them. The current Bush administration is probably the worst American administration that we have had in the 20th century. Uh, by that I mean that it is uh, the most unrestrained by public opinion, the most unrestrained by world opinion. It has the tightest little constellation of right-wing people that we have seen in government. And it seems to be absolutely determined to be at war. And uh, Mr. Bush uh, goes to uh, the United Nations to tell them uh, Iraq never complied with the UN resolution. Excuse me, Mr. President, Israel never complied with the UN resolution or didn't comply with a large number of them. Why didn't you show up to say that the UN should have backbone? After a year of bombing Afghanistan, Bush suddenly decides to turn his attention to Iraq. Now, I would say it seems obvious that having failed to accomplish anything against terrorism, in Afghanistan, and perhaps worried that the American public might catch on to this, the Bush administration finds another target. This is a man who has gassed his own people, used weapons of mass destruction on his own citizens. Gassed their own people with weapons of mass destruction. Gassed his own people with weapons of mass destruction. What they leave out are several other things. One is that Saddam Hussein was CIA. He was put in by the CIA. And CIA backed Saddam's right wing of the Ba'ath Party. And the Ba'ath Party went and murdered every Democrat, every progressive, every communist that was in Iraq, and then went and murdered the, the left wing of their own party. So they killed, tortured these people. They did all that. It's true what they say about him that he did do these terrible things. What they leave out is that when he was doing them, he was Washington's poster boy, and they couldn't have more praise for him. But then he turned around, he did something else, and that was that he, he nationalized the oil reserves and fields. He actually got the idea that our oil, which is in his land, would actually belong to him. There's always a question, how did all of our oil get into Iraqi land? Well, why did we put it all there, you know. And what Saddam Hussein has proved to be is a nationalist also. He's using some of those resources for health clinics, for education of his people. Even though he's a right winger and a, and a militarist, he was a nationalist. So he was an economic nationalist and they don't want that. They want a real complete comprador leader in Iraq. The goal is to get this country back into this global, multinational, corporate, free market system. The other goal, of course, is the old-fashioned colonial issue, just grabbing the oil. But there's 113 billion barrels of oil there at $40 a barrel. We're talking three, four trillion dollars. And Saddam Hussein is giving concessions to the Russians, Chinese, French, Italians, Brazilians, and Malaysians. Dick Cheney and George Bush and their people don't own a drop of this. Now, if they go in and take over the country, they'll take over all this, and those contracts are, can be suspended. That's, that's from a previous regime. They no longer have to be honored. You see, the Bush administration is not close to the oil industry. It's not friendly to it. It is. I mean, they, these guys are themselves oil men. Why do you think Bush then keeps saying that we know he has weapons of mass destruction, and he is an imminent threat, and he has links to Al-Qaeda. And he is not a democratic leader. He's a tyrant and all these things. He's saying those things to justify the attack against Iraq. 
Those are the same false pretexts that were used by his father to attack him. Remember this? Took incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. Babies pulled from incubators and scattered like firewood across the floor. Everyone believed this story. But there were no babies thrown on the floor. This woman turned out to be the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador and coached by their PR firm to tell this story. Nothing Iraq has done in recent months has been cause for identifying it as an aggressor, a threat. No, it's in the same position it was 10 years ago after the Gulf War. So this is an artificial creation. This is something conjured up by the Bush administration. Let's have another enemy. Let's turn attention away from Afghanistan. Let's turn attention away from the war on terrorism, which obviously we're not making any headway on. Oh, let's go to war against Iraq. When you look at what has happened and you try to find a, a rational explanation for it in terms of any of the reasons that the United States has given for going to war, they don't make sense. His own CIA, they are on record before a congressional committee saying we have no evidence of Saddam Hussein being linked to Al-Qaeda. They didn't say we have some suspicions, we have incomplete evidence, we don't have conclusive, we, they said we have no evidence of a link. Al-Qaeda doesn't want a secular leader like Saddam Hussein. I mean, there's Islam in, in Iraq. There are mosques and there's freedom of worship, but it's a secular society. The women can go around with their faces actually uncovered. The Bush family has more links to the bin Laden family than Saddam Hussein does, if you really want to look at it. You can't say terrorism has nothing to do about it. Terrorism is seized upon as a, one of the bogus issues to justify this attack against Saddam Hussein. There are all sorts of pretexts being used. They're going to war against Iraq because Saddam Hussein is a tyrant, one of many, many tyrants. If you look at the reports of Amnesty International, there are 30, 40 countries that have tyrannies, that practice torture, that imprison dissidents, that kill dissidents. So it can't be that. Uh, is it because he has weapons of mass destruction? Oh, well, something ridiculous about that has less weapons of mass destruction than any country that surrounds him. He may develop one nuclear weapon, they say. Israel has 200 nuclear weapons. The United States has 20,000 nuclear weapons. There are eight nuclear countries in the world. Two of them, India and Pakistan, almost went to, to nuclear war. And here is Iraq, which may develop one nuclear weapon. And they have weapons of mass destruction. We must do something. Something is obviously wrong there. Only an immense propaganda machine could persuade the American public that these reasons are sufficient to go to war. But there is an immense propaganda machine. Not only does the government have th this uh, network of, of propaganda mechanisms, but it has the press on its side because the American press is playing its usual deferential role. The American press is uh, playing the usual uh, obsequious uh, handmaiden to whatever the government wants to do. I mean, I just read in, oh, a week or so ago in the Boston Globe, you know, said we must praise Bush for his courage in challenging Saddam Hussein. I thought, really? How much courage does it take for a country armed with 20,000 nuclear weapons to challenge this fifth-rate military power, which has been devastated by two wars and 10 years of economic sanctions? What courage? But the fact that the Boston Globe felt required to salute the courage of the president is a sign of the general obsequiousness of the press towards the leader of the United States. And so you have a combination of government control, media complicity, and you have a public that is uninformed, is not given any history, and therefore will go along, although much of the public does not go along. 
which indicates that common sense can trump propaganda, that truth can trump lies. Uh, what's amazing is with that almost total control of the media that there are 50% of the American people who don't want to go to war. If all of the reasons given by the Bush administration don't make any sense, there must be other reasons. And the reasons are not hard to find. And one of them is the most obvious one. It has to do with oil. But that was the reason for the first Gulf War in 1991, oil. That is the reason behind all of American foreign policy since World War II. Ever since President Roosevelt got together with King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia in 1945 and essentially made a deal. The deal was, um, we will protect your monarchy. Talk about tyrannies. That Saudi Arabia is the tyranny of tyrannies. We'll protect your monarchy. We'll protect your tyranny. Uh, in return, we want access to your oil. And we want a foothold in the Middle East. And that deal has pertained. Everything the United States has done since then has been based on the quest for oil. I should add one thing to that. It's not even a matter of being deprived of oil. Because we would not be deprived of oil no matter who had the oil. Because whoever had the oil would have to sell it. They cannot drink it. They must sell their oil. The only question is, at what price will they sell their oil? If they want to sell it at their price, oh, that cannot be allowed. They must sell it at our price. And we'll go to war over the price of oil. Really. This may very well win militarily. After all, it has enormous power. It may win militarily, even quickly. But it will sow a legacy of hatred all over the world. That will be the, another serious blow to the American empire. So, Afghanistan, Iraq, who's next? Iran, Saudi Arabia, North Korea? Less than one week after overthrowing Saddam's regime, Washington was already threatening and making claims against Syria. But wait. First was the suggestion that Bush knew about 9-11, and then that the war with Iraq was not about freeing the Iraqi people, but about oil. Well, that would make Bush a murderer, and that can't be right. 
As I mentioned before, I'm from Texas. And so is the man of the new American century, George W. Bush. This is where Bush has his completely self-sustaining ranch, the place he calls home. Before being selected as president, he resided here as governor of Texas for six years. I grew up in a prison town. Huntsville is where the executions in Texas take place. And Texas is number one in the entire U.S. of A. for death penalty executions. Between the years 1982 and 2002, 299 human beings were executed here at the Walls Unit. This man executed over half in just six years. Still, only 152? That's not so bad. So why all this talk of Hitler? The German minister who compared Bush to Hitler was forced to resign, showing the power of the United States in the world that, uh, well, you mustn't criticize the American president. What a commentary on democracy. The whole idea of democracy is that you should be able to criticize government officials in whatever way you want. It's totalitarian states that require obedience to authority, that require a deference to the leader and we've been moving towards that point in the United States where you mustn't criticize the President of the United States. That's a, a very serious move away from democracy and towards a police state. Well, uh, George Bush is li like Hitler because there is a question of a larger hegemony, you know? You mm -hmm. understand? Um, absolutely. Yeah, to, to expand as much as possible. There's no validity to saying that G.W. Bush as a person is anything like Adolf Hitler. Uh, they're as different as, as two people could be. The comparison is not G.W. Bush, it's the Bush administration and the coalition of industrialists that put Hitler in power. The mistake is to say that, that this not very bright guy, that he's like Hitler. Hitler was a, a really unique person. G.W. Bush is nowhere near as capable or impressive as I think Adolf Hitler probably was. I mean, look, Hitler was a homeless guy at one time. Uh, he didn't come from a rich family. Uh, he didn't have the media behind him the way Bush did, or the money, or anything else. He was a failed street artist, in fact who became the most powerful person in the world and almost took over the whole world. I don't think Bush could take over uh, even a town in Texas by himself. But unfortunately, the Bush family, the Bush uh, dynasty, chose this particular child of theirs to, to be the New World Order Fuhrer, basically. And in that sense, it's a very frightening and very, I think, legitimate analogy. I mean, the comparison between Bush and Hitler, well, like all comparisons, it's not uh, saying that these two are identical, but it's, it's actually useful to see similarities between one situation and another, between one person and another. It's educational. Uh, and uh, after all, the United States compares Saddam Hussein to Hitler. Uh, and uh, that's worth comparing to. It's worth, worth, I mean, that's what freedom of speech is. It's worth uh, bringing up anything for people to think about. When they think about it, they can accept it, reject it, accept part of it, reject another part of it. Well, let's compare. George Bush was born to a rich, powerful family. Adolf Hitler was born to a poor family. George Bush went to Yale, 
one of the finest universities in the United States, while Hitler was denied admittance to the Academy of Fine Arts. His father didn't have connections. Whereas George Bush went AWOL for a year during his short tour with the National Guard, Hitler served his country in World War I. They are very different men. Still, images pop up all over the Internet, throughout anti-war protests, and all over the world, making this very comparison. So let's take a look at the man who proved to be one of the most notorious leaders of all time. Here is a glimpse at his first three years in office. Although not elected by a majority vote, and despite the fact that many citizens disputed his legitimacy as leader, this man soon became a champion of his people. Many also considered him a simpleton. He clearly showed his political roots from a southernmost state and an arrogance that infuriated foreign leaders as well as many of his own citizens. In the midst of economic troubles and faltering faith, a terrible thing happened. When an aide brought him word of the event, he proclaimed it as a terrorist act and a sign from God. He used it to justify an all-out war on terrorism. These terrorists, he said, traced their origins to the Middle East and found motivation for their evil deeds in their religion. He then passed legislation in the name of combating terrorism and fighting the philosophy he said spawned it. That legislation suspended constitutional rights of free speech, privacy, and habeas corpus. Police could now intercept mail and wiretap phones. Suspected terrorists could be imprisoned without specific charges and without access to lawyers. Police could sneak into people's homes without warrants. He stirred national pride among his countrymen by referring to their nation as the homeland. In a national outburst of patriotism, the flag was everywhere. After the first war came another, which was also connected with the terrorist act. He said these words to his frightened people after that infamous terrorist attack. He used that speech to introduce his creation of the Gestapo. And the rest, as they say, is history. Your enemy is not surrounding your country. Your enemy is ruling your country. And the day he and his regime are removed from power will be the day of your liberation. A philosophy or a system of government that advocates or exercises the dictatorship of the extreme right, typically through the merging of state and business leadership together with an ideology of belligerent nationalism. There's no simple dichotomy, oh, here's fascism and here's democracy. Uh, and certainly the union of corporate power and the government, uh, which as Mussolini said, is fascism. Uh, is a strong move towards fascism. And, uh, and we should recognize it as such. Now, Lenin's statement about fascism is capitalism dying. Probably true. It's, and it's true because fascism carries capitalism to its ultimate. It carries the union of corporate power and government power to its extreme, and it destroys civil liberties. And when you get to that point, you are reaching the end of the rope. I spoke with Michael Rupert, publisher of From the Wilderness, about his new book, Crossing the Rubicon, America's Descent into Fascism at the End of the Age of Oil. Now, fascism, to describe the United States of America, that seems a little extreme, I think, for like the majority of the public. How, how do you see it turning fascistic? Well, it's absolutely accurate, number one. I mean, throughout the 20s and 30s, when fascism was in vogue before the horrors of World War II, the terms fascism and corporatism were used interchangeably. Uh, it represented the merger of the state and corporate power, and that was openly discussed. But Mussolini said it. It's extremely interesting that uh, in his State of the Union address in January of 2003, George W. Bush 
quote, he referred to the evils of the last century as Hitlerism, communism, and militarism. He couldn't bring himself to say the word fascist because he is one. I also spoke with author Don Paul and asked if he really thought the U.S. was moving towards fascism. I think that the uh, Bush administration is following the designs of its family over several generations in uh, perpetrating a corporate state to the max and uh, trying to uh, basically institute a global empire. It's an exact factual line in terms of the Bush family's support of fascistic philosophy or government going back uh, at least to uh, George W. Bush's grandfather, Prescott Bush, who was one of the main financiers of Adolf Hitler's Nazi party uh, through the Union Banking Corporation. He was a Republican, his partner a Democrat, W. Igor Harriman, and he both funded uh, and employed slave labor at Auschwitz even after the United States had entered the war after Pearl Harbor. They didn't decease uh, from that. Uh, Prescott Bush and Abel Harriman until they were forced to by the Trading with the Enemy Act in 1942. Prescott Bush was a major supporter of the Nazi regime through uh, Brown Brothers Harriman, representing Standard Oil, uh, DuPont, major American investment houses, uh, funneling money to you know, IG Farben, uh, the Hamburg Steamship Line, Thiessen, Steel Trust, and all of that. You might be living in a fascist state if your leader wasn't democratically elected. The 2000 election is interesting. I think it's true that the American people have become cynical about elections. Half of them don't vote in presidential elections. More than half don't vote in local elections. Half of them don't vote in presidential which means the American people, uh, that half the American people say, well, what's the point? In the last election, more than 50% of the people in the United States did not go to vote, which tells you actually that more than half the people who are eligible to vote do not believe in the system anymore. They believe once the person gets in power, actually they will do what the business community, the real money behind the real decision-making in the states will force them to do. And so in something as as absolutely flagrant as the stealing of the election in 2000 takes place, not an election, but a selection has been pointed out of by the Supreme Court of the United States, not by the electorate, which after all gave more votes nationally to Gore than it did you know, to Bush. Uh, when something like that happens, so there's a tendency on the part of the American public to sort of shrug its shoulders and say, well, you know, that's the way it goes. The real power in the West is power of money. If you have money, that's it. If you don't have money, you can talk and do whatever you want. Nobody really will care about you, actually. You might be living in a fascist state if your country's perpetually at war. The government is not the country. You know, very often you hear them interview young men going off to war, and they say, well, I feel I must fight for my country. They're not fighting for their country. 
They're fighting for the government. They're fighting for the political leaders. They're fighting for the corporations that will make money from the war. Now, during the Vietnam War, the, there was a famous poster that said, War is good for business. Invest your son. Chilling. But true. You might be living in a fascist state if your civil liberties are being taken away because of an external enemy. Danger to the facility. Do not be persuaded by strangers or individuals you do not know well to take articles aboard your flight. You are also reminded that any inappropriate remarks or jokes concerning security may result in your arrest. We appreciate your cooperation while these measures are in effect. I think that's silly. That is very silly. <laughs> For real, that's silly. That is very silly. Just arresting people just because of comments that are made? Nah, that's un-American. I think that's like infringing on some of our civil rights and whatnot, basically. Because, I mean, like, it's supposed to be America, aren't this? What, isn't that what we're going to war for? Freedom, yada, 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 and so on. And they're talking about arresting people for that? Nah, that's, that's not cool whatsoever. The uh, Homeland Security Bill and the Patriot Act basically allow the government to deem uh, whomever it chooses as a, a threat and to imprison that person. Because of my experience, I want everybody in the world to know what's going on in this country. Um, do not be afraid to voice your opinions about anything political. You're allowed to do that under the Constitution. You're allowed to send emails, private message, uh, letters, telephone calls. But see, uh, the President of the United States now wants to take all that away. They want to start monitoring every phone conversation, every email that crosses the country. And don't stop doing it. And, if, and when you get tired of it, or if you're tired of it already, write your congressman and let them know. Flood them with millions of letters. You might be living in a fascist state if your public servants gas, shoot, or poison their own people.
When I am critical of the United States, uh, people say, yes, but isn't the United States the best country in the world? Well, my response is, it's not a simple matter to characterize a country as the best or worst. I mean, it's not like the top ten musical selections, you know. I mean, there are obvious ways in which the United States is uh, superior to many places in the world. And we have more, civ more civil liberties, even with the attacks on our civil liberties, we have more civil liberties than a lot of places in the world. Uh, we certainly have more goodies, more television sets, more cars uh, than any other country in the world, except that these goodies are very unevenly distributed. And, you know, it's very easy to simply look at the United States as a country of middle class people enjoying prosperity and so on and forget that there are 40 million poor people in this country. There, that 40 million is equivalent to the population of the most countries in the world. And there are 40 million people without health insurance, that one out of five children in the United States grows up poor. That we have two million people in prison in the United States, the largest rate of incarceration is something, there's a sickness there represented. And so I wouldn't simply rush to talk about how great we are. Uh, sure, if you measure us against the worst places in the world, we're great. If you measure us against what we should be, what we can be, what our great wealth enables us to be, we have failed. We have failed to take the enormous wealth that this country possesses and use it for the betterment of the people to follow the principles of the Declaration of Independence, an equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There is no equal right. There's no equal right to justice in this country. The poor get one kind of justice, the rich get another. The people who are black and colored get one kind of justice, and people who are white and well-off get another kind of justice. No, there are many, many things to criticize, and we should not hesitate to criticize. No, we should measure ourselves against what we should be and what we can be. Uh, and it should not be considered unpatriotic to criticize the government, or the system of capitalism, or the system of justice. The whole idea of democracy is that you should have the right to look critically at your society. Well, we should teach all young people in the schools about the Declaration of Independence. I mean, really, not just hang it on the wall, but really teach them what it means. We have the philosophy of the Declaration of Independence, which is the fundamental philosophy of democracy. Governments are artificial creations. Governments are set up by the people to achieve certain ends, equal right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And when governments become destructive of those ends, that's the language of the Declaration, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish this government. So if this is a struggle between democracy and fascism, republic and empire, which side is winning? Is the United States of America bound for liberty? Or do we just have liberty bound? Until then, we remain the land of the free and the home of the brave.
they want to try them all on you. Yeah, they do. And if the first one don't get you, the next two will do. I got the napalm blues in my backyard. I got the napalm blues in my backyard. Well, my dog is dead, my cat is dead, my sisters have gone. Chew on that.